morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, one and all. Uh, live from the meeting house of the Presbyterian Church of Lawrenceville. There we go. Uh, wherever you are, as you are, we're glad you're here. Um, I see a few new faces among us, and so special welcome to you if you are here for the first time or just generally uh, new to the Presbyterian Church of Lawrenceville. If you're in person here, um, there is a Connect card you'll find in that little rack in front of you. Uh, please do fill that out and put it in the plate as it comes by. The plates are actually going to come by. We're going to be actually taking up uh, the the uh, offering uh, from now on, at least until the uh, as long as the way is clear. And if you're joining us for the first time online, please just put your name in the in the chat, and that way we can know to greet you appropriately. A few announcements before we begin. Worship is always not a substitute for reading the bulletin. All of this is in the bulletin, just to highlight for your own reading and bring to your attention some very important things. It's all important what's in the bulletin. Today is the first Sunday of Advent, and so commend to you the practice of reading the online, reading the Advent devotional that our adult education committee has put together. If you have access to email, we, we ask that you subscribe to that via email. You can get it um, by emailing Tom Wilfred, and uh, I think the instructions are there on our website to uh, subscribe, or you can just email the office and we'll get you set up. If you don't, uh, and if you prefer having a hard copy, they are available at both entrances of the meeting house. Please avail yourself of that opportunity to devote yourself to uh, a, that practice, that spiritual practice during Advent. A few things that are coming up, please, this Saturday is our holiday market from 10 to 2. Uh, that will be taking place right here, and it's a great way to begin your holiday shopping, your Christmas shopping, and also do good, as it is a way that we fund our mission budget. Uh, in that same time, 10 to 2, there will be an art exhibit right here in the Meeting House from 1 to 3. It will be really interesting, and I, I, I uh, really urge you to check it out um, this Saturday from 1 to 3. Read more about that in the bulletin. Worship in a New Key, our alternative worship service at 5 in the chapel with Dark Whiskey. That's the band, not the liquid. Um, and uh, so we're going to be, of course, focusing on Advent at that, at that worship service. Um, as last Sunday, we invited you to offer something other than money. Um, we, we so often, of course, do that as part of our Christian practice. But to make known what it is that you might be willing to do as part of this motley crew, the Presbyterian Church of Lawrenceville. So at both entrances, there's also the survey that was made available last week. Please do fill that out. Um, we really need your help in so many different ways to make this ministry happen. Uh, you can also find that online. Just go to our website and you can go to the online version of the, uh, of the uh, time and talent survey. Our Stewardship Drive, our campaign for 2020, is of course underway, and our gifts are running about 7% more than they were last year. So the givers who've made a pledge, the average is about uh, up about 7%. Let's keep that trend going. In case you haven't made a pledge commitment, a giving commitment for 2022, we urge you to do that. You can do that online via our website or simply email Tina Koch. Again, you can find her email on our website. Every Sunday we have a moment for generous living where we lift up and give thanks to someone uh, in our community faith or someone's for their generosity and their contribution. And today I want to lift up two people, of course it makes sense because they're married to each other, uh, that we give thanks for both of them, David and Linda Sung. Um, those who, of course, most of us know David and Linda. David is the clerk of session, and Linda is uh, is on the board of deacons, and of course, a power deacon, one of our uh, one of our um, uh, very active deacons. And uh, you have no idea what it is that they do behind the scenes to further the ministry and the cause of Jesus Christ as part of this congregation. So next time you see David and Linda, please give thanks to them. We give thanks for each other as we seek together to equip one another for generous living in the name of Jesus Christ. Let us then move from getting here truly to being here as we gather together to worship God. Let us worship.
Friends, this is the first Sunday in Advent. It's the time where we're about to light the candle of hope. And as Christians, we have hope. Hope for a just world, for peace to flow like a river, for suffering of every kind to cease. We yearn for joy that is contagious, for nations that become neighbors, for hospitals that are empty. And we hope, we hope for the world that God promises. And here in this place, we join our faith to our hope. And that cause of hope is sure because God is its source. God is here, God is still at work, and so we have hope. Let us worship our living, loving Lord as we sing verses one and four of our opening hymn. Our God and Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning to praise you and adore you. Let us pray. Gracious Father, in this season of thanksgiving, remind us of the truth that every good and perfect gift comes from you. We consider the Thanksgiving meal a time of celebration and unity, yet our country is filled with division. We admit that even in our moment of gratitude, we fall short. We feel thankful for the gifts without acknowledging the giver. We praise the beautiful creation around us without drawing close to the creator. We sing about our salvation without glorifying you, our savior. Forgive us. Remind us, O God, that any good we experience is only a glimpse of your character, that any blessing is only a foretaste of what you have in store for those who put their hope in you, and that even our lives, the very breath in our lungs, is only there because of your deep love for us. We are grateful and humble that our specific circumstances are in your wisdom that way for a reason, having or ha not having a job, a house or a car, being in good health or being ill, the events around us are also known to you and part of your grand design. Lord, please help us to see your presence in all of the church. Please help us to find new ways to partner together in service of you and the world as we silently confess our sins to you now. God, reveal yourself to us in every good gift, and give us eyes to see you in them. In Christ's holy name we pray, amen.
please stand as you are able to hear the good news. Family of faith, even when we throw in the towel, even when we all think we are hopeless cases, when we see nothing but faults in ourselves and in others, we still have hope. And we have hope because God has not forgotten us. God wants us, God claims us, God calls us to be God's own. Not just now, but each and every day. So, hear and trust the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are loved, we are called, we are claimed, and we are forgiven and made new. Thanks be to God, and let all God's children say, Amen. Amen. Be seated, and the Hollingsworth family will be lighting our first Advent candle. We hope for a world where all are fed. We hope for a world with more bridges than walls. We hope for a world with wide open doors. We hope for a world with contagious laughter. We hope for a world where trees grow tall and creeks run clean. We hope for a world where all people feel at home, in their bodies, in the church, in their physical homes. We hope for that world. We long for that world. We are homesick for that world. So today we light the candle of hope because hope keeps our hearts alive as we wait. May this light be a reminder that the wait is always worth it. We are close to home. May we carry the hope with us. Amen. Well, I would invite all of the boys and girls, the children, to come forward for the children's message today. All right. Ah, such enthusiasm. That's terrific. Great. Welcome, welcome. Come on up. All right. Well, today is kind of a special Sunday. I mean, every Sunday is special, but something's different today. Anybody know what it is? We are beginning something new Today, yes, and today is the first Sunday of Advent. That's what I wanted to talk about. There's that word Advent. Anybody know? I mean, probably not a word you use uh, much of the time. Probably don't use that word often, but what does it mean? Anybody have an idea what Advent means? Yeah, Tommy, what does it mean? Yeah, it's, it's before Christmas. It's the season before Christmas. The word actually means beginning. The word Advent means beginning, and it is the, the period of time in the church year before Christmas. Exactly right. So it's kind of like New Year's Day. The church has a calendar just like we have a regular calendar, so this would be kind of like January 1 
in church. It's the new year. And so Advent is the beginning of the year, but a be- the beginning of something else. What, what is it that we begin to do? And this is maybe a question that's hard to, uh, to answer, so I'll answer it myself. It's the beginning of telling the story of Jesus, right? So today we, we, we tell that story every year, but we tell it again and again because we've we see new things in it. Yes, Tommy, what do you want to say? You saw a black X thing. A black what? A black thing. Yeah, that's what we're, well, exactly. Okay, so everybody, I want, yes, very observant. Some of you might have seen our Facebook post because we have the story of, of uh, Advent, the story of Jesus and Jesus' birth all around us. So what do you see? You see the characters in the story everywhere. Come on up here. Come up, up here and join me. So what do you see? Um, anybody see anything over here? Yeah, though, so the, there's the shepherd and the sheep. They're going to play a part in the Christmas story, right, when the angel appears to them. What else do you see? Yeah, yeah way up there. Who, who is that up there on the organ pipes? Any ideas? You know who that is, Tommy? That's King Herod, exactly. He is at the highest point because he thinks he's in charge, right? And what, what do you think he's pointing at? He might be pointing at, like, go find the Christ child because I want to worship him. But does he really want to worship him? No, he wants to get rid of him because he's a threat to his power. That's not good. So King Herod is up there. Well, do you see anything else up there? Who are those? It's kind of hard to see who those are by the organ pipes. And he... Camel's there, yeah, camel, and, and three other figures, that's a clue. Who are those people? The three wise men, yeah, right there. Well, anybody else that you see? Probably the most important folks we're missing. Who are, who are, who's kind of at the center of the story? Mary and Joseph, where are they? Anybody? Anybody see? It's kind of hard. All right, so... Right there. There you go. Right there. So every Sunday, you know what? They're going to be traveling, and so are the wise men. Probably Herod is going to be up there on his throne in Jerusalem each Sunday, but I want you to come and see how the characters move during the Christmas story. As you read the Christmas story through the Advent devotional, you have a placemat to help you uh, celebrate each day of Advent in your family, and I want you to do that, okay, with the placemat that you're given in Logos. All right, thank you so much for coming up and celebrating the story with me. Let's have a brief prayer, and then we'll go to Sunday school. Let us pray. Holy One, thank you for this season, this new beginning, as we tell once again the story of Jesus. Amen. All right, so the adults say, may the Lord be with you there, and the children say, may the Lord be with you here. We'll see you later. Our scripture lessons come both from Isaiah and also from 1 Thessalonians. And the first reading, I mean, sorry, Jeremiah, not Isaiah. Um, Jeremiah is bringing a word of hope. And the word of hope is that God is faithful to God's promises. So here's what he says to his people. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. And then Paul is speaking to the Thessalonian congregation. He's not with them currently, but he hopes to visit them soon. And they are a cause of joy to him. And here's what he says to them. 
How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we feel before our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you face to face and restore whatever is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we abound in love for you. And may he so strengthen your hearts in holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O come, Holy Spirit, come as the fire and burn. Come as the wind and cleanse. Come as the light and reveal. Come as the water and refresh. Holy God, convict us and convert us and consecrate us until we are holy and completely yours. Amen. So I have this habit um, that I do every night uh, after I've finished my work and kind of wound down, watch a couple of YouTube videos, my brain candy at the end of the day, and do my bedtime routine. And when my head hits, hits the pillow, I give thanks. I offer a prayer of thanksgiving. I can't kind of not do it. It's a habit. And as I do that, there's a companion thought that often creeps into my head. I think, you know, if this was a really bad day, would I still give thanks? I mean, if something really horrible happened, like I have had an automobile accident, or God forbid something should happen to Catherine or Will, would I still give thanks? Would I say what uh, Job says at the end of that first chapter of the book of Job? You may recall that Job, at the very beginning of the story, is, gives thanks to God for all the incredible blessings that God has bestowed upon him. He's wealthy, and he's got this thriving family, and uh, all of it disappears by the end of the first chapter. Wealth, poof, gone. His family all killed. Yet despite all that, at the end of the first chapter, Job says, Naked I came out of my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If times got really tough, would I be able to do the same thing? Would I be able to give thanks in the hard times? I hope so. Life wasn't easy for the believers in that little church in Thessalonica. Let me say a little bit about the context of Paul's letter to them, his first letter to the church in Thessalonica. Uh, Paul had established this church but didn't quite have enough time to really create a solid foundation for that church. He went to the synagogue and that's Often a way he got converts for the Christian faith, but the synagogue leadership wasn't exactly that friendly to the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and uh, they complained to the town fathers, uh, and they chased them out, uh, Paul and Timothy, before they could really finish the job of establishing that church in Thessalonica. Uh, and so uh, Paul wasn't able to kind of go check on them. Uh, he and Timothy themselves are also facing persecution, as are uh, undoubtedly the believers in that little church in Thessalonica. Uh, and so because Paul couldn't get to them, Paul sends Timothy to check on them and see how they're doing, fully expecting that it had all fallen apart, that the believers who initially adopted the message of Jesus Christ had gone back to the worship of idols because it was hard to profess faith in Jesus Christ. And Timothy returns with a surprising message. Things had not fallen apart. 
Actually, the church, that little fledgling church in Thessalonica was thriving. They continued to meet together and to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the reaction of Paul and Timothy is, is a kind of giddy thanksgiving. Paul gives thanks for their thanks and for their hope and steadfastness amidst persecution. They're both like proud parents. You know what that might feel like at a certain point when your child does something that is worthy of pride and praise and, and you think, you know what, I, I don't think I made that happen. I might have had my part as a parent, but the, the universe made this happen, this person who seemed to turn out, at least at this point, so well. You know that kind of gratitude. Despite all the challenge, the church in Thessalonica was thriving. So the question for the day, for us to contemplate as we think about this message, how do you live gratefully? How do you live hopefully in the hard times? And the answer, I think Paul would agree with, is a very, very simple one. Together. How do you live gratefully? How do you live hopefully in the toughest of times? You do it together. You know, American religion in many ways has been, been infected by uh, the particular culture in which we live in America. You know, Alexis de Tocqueville called it. that We're, we're all rugged individualists. We all know that. We've talked about it. But uh, it's infected our practice of Christian faith. Uh, take, for example, what many churches require as a profession of faith for those joining us. We don't exactly use the same phraseology, but... You know, we we ask them to say, Jesus Christ is my personal Lord and Savior. We leave out that word personal here, actually. But that's that's what we kind of mean oftentimes. My personal Lord, I have to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Nothing necessarily wrong with that. But it, it, it then can become just about Jesus and me. That's what it's about. And going to church can then become like transactional. I do it because it makes me feel good. I get something out of it. Like going to the gym. I don't necessarily want to go. But at the end of it, when I'm done, I feel good, you know? And so maybe church is like that in this culture of individualism when it's about me and Jesus. And there's nothing wrong with that. Don't get me wrong. Going to church, making you feel good, that, that's not a bad thing. But what can infect our practice of faith is that it's just about me and Jesus when really it's about us. In some ways, I wish we could replace that statement of faith with Jesus Christ is our communal Lord and Savior, and I personally commit to following him. I probably need some work, but something like that, maybe. How do you live gratefully? How do you live hopefully? In the hard times. And let me remind us that the hard times, that's not some abstraction today. Like the hard times are somewhere in the future or behind us or some other place. The hard times, well, those are now. Those are now. I don't know if you felt like I did on Friday, the day after Thanksgiving. The first Thanksgiving back, really, uh, to some normalcy. And then we heard about this new variant, the Omicron variant that threatens to knock us back into lockdowns. Um, just when we thought maybe this thing could be over. These are the hard times. And it's important to remind ourselves that we find hope. We find the means to give thanks in the hard times, not just by grinning and bearing it, but together. You know, many sociologists are uh, studying this time and, and what people are doing, how they're responding to it. And Uh, Ironically, many of the institutions that give people uh, a sense of community and belonging and meaning and hope, like the church, people are finding it difficult to return. And I realize maybe it's nice to be able to do church in your bunny slippers and your bathrobe and kind of tune in while you're doing the dishes. And maybe that's fine to some degree, but it's not ever going to substitute for being together, celebrating the message asking for that grace that gives us hope. And so Paul and Timothy want to be there with those people to help build up their hope, to help build up their faith. 
And the, the passage ends that you may be found blameless at the coming of Jesus Christ. That's what we celebrate, is our hope for the return of Christ. But it's important to note that when he says that you may be found blameless, this is an interesting point. There's no word in English that we can use to translate that second person pronoun because in Greek there are two. There's the singular and there's the plural. We only have one in English. So when we hear that, maybe we say, so you, I as an individual, no, Paul is talking about the community. So you all, maybe that's a way to translate it. So y'all can be found blameless on that day. How do you find hope and gratitude in the tough times? Do it together. So what exactly does that mean that we ought to do? Here's where we get to the hortatory exhortation part of the sermon. I think this is what Paul might have us do. Uh, and first of all, I'm not passing myself as, off as a Paul, uh, but I'm doing what Paul encourages us to do, which is to imitate him. So here's, here's my first move. It's to give thanks for you. I cannot tell you how grateful I am for you. Uh, for the way this community of faith has come together in a difficult time. Um, I, I mean, there's still people who haven't come back, but the core of folks are so strong, and you have been the hands and feet of Jesus Christ for each other and for the community around us. And I, I just cannot tell you how grateful I am and how much that has encouraged me, how much that's meant to me. And so if I'm able to give thanks in the most difficult times, it's probably would be because of you and what you do and who you are and the way grace travels through a human community like this one. So I give you thanks. But what, what is it that we all can do is, is that very thing, you know, it's a sort of axiomatic thing. How do you live gratefully in the hard times? Well, you give thanks. And maybe you don't just give thanks for something abstract. We sit around our Thanksgiving table, you know, give thanks for the cliches, my shelter, my family, my job, all of that. And that's important, but why not give thanks for someone or someones? That's the exhortation I want to end with, is to take a moment to give thanks for someone, like Paul's doing here, for those people he thought had fallen away. This is what we're trying to do as a community of faith. The leadership have been challenged to call a couple people just to say, how are you doing? So why not do that, everybody? Get that church directory. Uh, if it's online, it's, you got it through the database that you're all part of. Or if you don't have a hard copy and want one, we'll get you one. Call a couple people and say, how are you doing? I'm really grateful for you. I want you to know that. I've missed you. Uh, or, or uh, how's your son doing? How's your mom? You cannot know how important that is to people to be connected to, to, to give thanks as we give thanks for them. So my brothers and sisters, how do you live gratefully and hopefully in the hardest of times together? Amen.
and sisters, while we're on our feet, let us share our affirmation of faith, which you'll find printed in the bulletin. Jesus taught us to speak of hope as the coming of God's kingdom. We believe that God is at work in our world, turning hopelessness and evil situations into good. We believe that goodness and justice will triumph in the end, and that tyranny and oppression cannot last forever. One day all tears will be wiped away, the lamb will lie down with the lion, and justice will roll down like a mighty stream. True peace and true reconciliation are not only desired, they are assured and guaranteed in Christ. This is, this is our faith. faith. This, this is, is our hope. Please be seated. Brothers and sisters, our Christian faith calls us to live lives filled with joy, motivated by love, and guided by hope. Our tithes and our offerings will seek to establish these things in the lives not only of people here in this congregation, but in the lives of people outside our congregation, bringing love, bringing joy, and bringing hope. So let us give our offerings to God. There are three ways to do that. Uh, there, the plates will come um, through the meeting house. If you are worshiping with us online, you will find a, a giving link in the chat you certainly can go onto our website and you can look for the donate button in the top right corner and give that way. And as always, you can, ma you can mail a check to the church. So will our ushers please come forward to receive our morning offering. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Holy One, through our prayers, we send love invisible. Through our giving, we send love made visible. Bless our offerings this day, enabling them to work your will on earth, bringing joy and peace, faith, hope, and love. For these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, some of us sat at Thanksgiving tables this weekend where we ate way too much and too often. But here at this table, you can never eat too much or too often. Jesus meets us here, not just those of us with strong faith. Jesus also meets those of us whose faith is shaky and weak because he calls us all to come and be nourished. He is both the substance and the host of this meal. This is not a Presbyterian table. This is the Lord's table. Here we find grace, love, nourishment, and acceptance. All is ready. Let us come. Let us receive the gifts that Christ has promised and provided for us. Let us pray. To you, Holy One, we lift our hearts in prayer. We put our trust in you, Lord, believing that your word is true. We lift up our need for hope as we experience the brokenness in our world. You promised hope to the Israelites, and you kept your promise. You promised hope in the coming of your Son, and he was and is hope for our world. You promised hope to the early church, and that hope resulted in exponential growth. You promise hope to us, and we pray for your life-giving, life-changing, world-changing presence. Lord, we need your strength when our faith falters, Give us confidence in your presence in our lives and in our world. Pour out your love so that it fills our lives and splashes over on everyone around us. Fill us with your joy and peace as we go through this busy time of year, for we know that your son, Emmanuel, is on the way. Therefore, we praise you with the faithful in every time and place, saying, Holy, 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 God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. On the night before Jesus died, he sat at table with his disciples, and taking bread, he gave thanks for it, and he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner also, when they had supped, Jesus took the cup. He gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take this cup. It's the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. All of you drink from it. For as often as you drink of this cup and eat of this bread, you do show forth the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes again. Friends, let us partake of the elements of communion. As you take the portable communion elements, it's wise to first remove the topmost layer, the foil that separates the wafer 
and then the second level of foil. Take and eat. body of Christ broken for you and the cup of hope poured out for you. Please join me in prayer. God of grace, you renew us at your table with the bread of life. May this spiritual food strengthen our faith, deepen our love for you and our neighbors, and draw us into lives of service and praise. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we worship a Lord who is also the Prince of Peace, who has promised us peace. And so it is that it's a wonderful thing to be able to share that peace with our brothers and sisters in Christ. So I invite you now to actually stand up, to uh, greet your neighbors with a sign of Christ's peace. May the peace of Christ be with you.
That song from Teze is a worthy charge for all of us uh, to go forth, to give thanks, not to be afraid, uh, but to find hope in the act of giving thanks. And so sing that and do that. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and community of the Holy Spirit be ours both now and forevermore. And let all of God's people say, Amen. Oh, machines and they break.